So what's funny about this is I've been hearing a lot of things like, I've been seeing some maps of North America, I've been seeing some very large scale range maps, and some terms like nuisance parameters. And I use this picture to inspire my peers in individual level demography um, to think broader about their, uh, their ecosystems. You know, so my life is actually very much so the small stuff. And so um, I think my perspective will either comfort you, the things that I'll tell you today, or terrify you. Um, and so essentially, um, today what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about two case studies um, that are sort of integral to my, um, my grad and postdoc work. The first is from a uh, community in a sagebrush steppe ecosystem where we have grasses and sagebrush uh, that are together in a community persisting over stably apparently over long terms. And so this is a meter square quadrat where you can see individuals. Um, and the second is about uh, an invasive species called Carduus nutans. It's a thistle that's an invasive species in North America. And I like to think about how this thing spreads through space. And so just to go down to the very basic level, you know, we as demographers often are looking at individuals. So we'll go out in the field and measure one individual at one time step, and then go out again some time later. And obviously by time, I sort of mean like a year or a couple of years, not millions of years. And we know that things have happened in the meantime. So there has been precipitation, some of it in the form of snow and some of it in the form of rain. And often we have data on a very, very um, high resolution here. So sometimes this is like daily data and more recently things have become on a minute by minute scale. And we know that some of these factors, even though they're all precipitation, um, some heavy snowfall may damage the plant while some heavy rainfall in the spring may actually improve its odds of survival and growth in the next year. And so we're using this in these meter squared quadrats uh, where each of these individuals has been mapped. And so we have actually a long-term data set uh, through the Adler Lab at Utah State where we're looking at how um, cover changes over time. And so we're actually looking at fine scale resolution on when precipitation or temperature are affecting these plants and when individual competition uh, with, its, with neighbors affects the ultimate plant size of an individual. So um, we put together some very intense statistical methods uh, that we published last year, um, and they turn out to have like mediocre predictive success. Mediocre to um, minor. Um, and so essentially, you know, in this scale at least, um, you know, one of the things that um, I want to say about this system is that these things matter. So if we have a good year and we assume that everyone grows, then we know that, they, that our estimates of um, cover and productivity um, are increased. But if we're making those assumptions about um, every individual in that plot and we're wrong, then um, we might be misestimating uh, cover and productivity and we may be incorrect about our models of competition and coexistence. But to take a big step back, <laughs> this may not matter very much at all, even on the scale that we're talking about, because up to 70% of the variation in individual plant size is attributable to size of that individual in the previous year. And so when I take that all the way back to sort of the geographic scale, when we're talking about things like competition or we're talking about climate effects, you know, some of the things that I'm interested in in this group is talking about our objectives for our models, trying to figure out uh, what exactly, what the time horizon that we're looking at trying to predict things for, and thinking about which parameters are relevant. And in the second case study, I looked at a species called uh, nodding thistle, which is invasive in North America. Uh, it's actually invaded the entire North American continent in under 125 years or something. This is a picture of it, and it's... Uh, common Pennsylvania habitat, where there's lots of grazing, it affects uh, grazing pastures negatively. One of the great things about this species is that we can easily quantify the traits that matter to its success in a landscape. We can go out in the field and measure its plant height. In the lab, we can measure the terminal velocity of seeds, and we can measure seed release in wind tunnels. 
And we can use all of this information and math mathematical models of population spread, which is cool. Um, so we can combine all this information. It's sort of like a ballistic model, but it's got a few extra param parameters like turbulence um, to actually produce, pr to produce a dispersal kernel. And we can provide estimates of population spread. And so when we start from first principles about just the characteristics that are going on with the plant, we can actually project dispersal distance based on traits. So when we do that, when we build a dispersal kernel based on just, um, just the information that we know about the plant species, we can predict that the 95th percentile of seeds in Pennsylvania should move about 0.89 kilometers. And another aspect of this study is that um, here in Pennsylvania, 10 years ago, uh, my supervisor did a, an extensive mapping um, exercise where an undergraduate actually drove all of the roads between Harrisburg and State College in Pennsylvania um, to map uh, the distribution of these two invasive plant species and all these white dots or uh, populations of this thistle. And then I had to do it as a graduate student 10 years later. And so what we've actually been using is this new information to infer the dispersal distance that individuals would have had to have traveled in order to accomplish the population spread that we observed. And when we infer that dispersal distance, we can see that it's our uh, 95th percentile of seeds are moving about 1.1 kilometers. This looks like a similar ballpark to me, but it is something like 20% uh, underestimation when we're doing it from, um, from sort of baseline analysis of plant traits. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to do was look at why we might have this discrepancy. And this, in part, could just be simple uh, misparameterization of the dispersal kernel. So the, the models that we're using are long-tailed, but they're not particularly fat-tailed. And so we might actually be underestimating it simply because of our model choice. But it may also be because there are certain ways that this species interacts with its environment that we are not quite estimating when we're just measuring a handful of plants, either um, in the field or in the lab. And so I went through all of the studies that had taken place in my advisor's lab and um, looked at the scale at which uh, variation was measured among individuals and then finding out uh, whether the uh, scale of the magnitude of the spread level effects was commensurate with that variation. So in the past, they've actually measured the species in its native and its invasive range. So in the, inv in the native range, plants are very short. They produce very shrimpy seeds, not quite like that plant that I uh, showed you earlier where they have the big, beautiful papai. Uh, but in the invasive range, plants can get over a meter and a half tall, uh, obviously getting higher into the, into the air where they can disperse seeds further. Um, and so then we've also done things like manipulate climate um, in uh, the invasive range. We've done things like mow and manage plants. We've looked at um, how a biocontrol weevil affects the dispersal of this, sp of this species. And we've done some breeding and individual level experiments where we actually look at the difference between seeds on the same plant. And what we found was interesting and useful for this group because the major difference in this species spread rate occurs over those geographic scales. So the comparison between the invasive and the native range creates a huge difference. The invasive range spread rate is you know, 300% higher than that in its native range. But all these other effects, things like inducing water warming, c inducing drought in a greenhouse where, we where plants are actually shorter, uh, adding nutrients, observing how weevils affect the, the plumes on the seeds, um, certain breeding issues and phenotypes, you can see that the magnitude of the difference between two seeds within the same flower head can induce a 50% change in spread rate, right? So even all of these regional to local level effects that um, can happen to a plant can, are sort of on the same mat scale of magnitude, um, but that geographic one is the one that matters the most. Um, so I guess overall what I'm sort of I have lots of people to thank, but I think overall, you know, when we're asking do differences between individuals or individual level responses affect population level measures, uh, we can all breathe a sigh of, sigh of relief and try to generalize over a lot of these things, I think, even though I do love sweating the small stuff. <laughs>
Um, the, that graph you just showed where geography is the major effect, um, does that mean evolution between the two parts of the range? Is that what you're saying? Or? Probably it's community level competition in those different ranges. So this species um, is pretty genetically homogenous. Given that it's rapid expansion in the in, uh, invasive range, there has actually not been that much, um, uh, there hasn't been that much evolution that ha this species is very similar to uh, what it is in the native range. Including those traits that you measure? It is extraordinarily plastic, though. So the way it responds in the nor native range is very different than the way that it responds in its in invaded, ra invaded range. So, so I also had a question about this figure. Mm -hmm. um, I think these comparisons between native and, 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 and uh, invasive uh, uh, communities are really neat. And so I was trying to understand this a little bit better. So when you say climate warming and mm -hmm. you, have, um, you have positive values, does that mean in the native versus uh, invasive place, or what does that mean? What does that bar mean? Yeah, so in an in a attempt to flash through it, I totally skipped all the details. So in the warming experience, we were actually in the invad invaded range using open top chambers to warm the surface of the ground. And so the plants that were grown in the invasive range it, under control conditions would have lower projected spread rates than those were that were grown under warmed conditions. So as to um, simulate what might happen in Pennsylvania under 1.5 degrees increase uh, in temperature. So was the invasive range where it's already invaded and the other was in the area that's not? Same place, just exactly in, yeah, in the center of the invaded range. So this, there are different experiments here. So the geography aspect, those were plants that were measured in the invasive range uh, in Pennsylvania, in Kansas, uh, there are other plants. In I see. That's the only one that's. A these are okay, all separate it. experiments. I, I get yeah. It now, yeah. Sorry, and they are c the bars are positive if the baseline um, control or whatever, um, as compared to the treatment effect. So drought actually increased spread in this species. I, I'm curious about how much um, historical contingency or random effects like the opening of a new field or something like that affect the processes at this small scale, at the individual scale, and then how much that becomes just a nuisance when you are thinking about bigger scale patterns. Yeah, so this species has spread over like way more than it's capable of spreading without the influence of humans. So humans are the number one cause of this species expansion. However, here where this is, we believe this is mostly infilling. So these are mostly plants that are moving from one farmer's field to another farmer's field. Um, there is a strong association with alfalfa and grazing crops. And so opening a field from moving from corn to something like that may have provided an opportunity for these species to move into areas they wouldn't have been maybe 10 years ago. Um, however, the, the farming system is pretty consistent there. Um, we do have a, a large number of Amish farmers uh, who tend to grow similar crops on a regular basis. Um, and the other thing, I mean, just basically from being in this area, I mean, this is very, it's 40 kilometers, it's not a big area. Um, I think that most of the processes that are taking place here, especially along roadsides that are pretty consistently that type of roadside, over the decade where we were studying these things, I think a lot of these processes are due to the natural, the natural response of the species in the environment. Um, you may have already said this. What's the seed dormancy going on with carduus? Not much. There's not much. Not okay, much. so you don't. This is not. This is not dispersal through time and abandoned fields or popping back no. up or something like that. No, definitely not. They're they're a pretty crappy plant. <laughs> can spread fast, but they, they, they're not good at anything, really. Uh, so I have a question about the sagebrush. Sure. Right there. Um, you said that, you know, your, basically your, your models for predicting the community dynamics were mediocre <laughs> to minor or something. And then they were like, well, that's maybe it's because you just do better just using size from the previous year, right? But I guess the question is, is there a time frame, temporal scale at which you do better? Like you look at longer scales, integrate over 
a generational scale rather than a year scale, is at what point do you do the best? We do the very best when we're trying to predict next year. When we know exactly what the size of the plan is this year. Right, but then yeah, you're I understand. Sort of I, I'm being sarcastic. Yeah, I understand. We actually have, I mean, Katie can also chime in on some of this. I think that, um, at least in my climate models, um, the way we estimate competition through competition kernels, the way that we estimate um, whether we're using random year effects or whether we're using very high intensity statistical models trying to get spring precipitation separated out from winter precipitation. We, but we're better off having tried nothing at all. <laughs> it's random. Oh, um, I, so when you're talking about not, not having to sweat the individual level thing, mm. um, I'm not quite sure I followed the transition from the dispersal thing to that. Sure. Because it kind of sounded like which individuals you me measure matter a lot as far as what you're predicting, so. Yeah, um, and actually I think that, well yeah, so these are still big numbers, right? So when we look, it, it, I guess that's what I mean when I say objectives. So these are still big numbers that depending on which seed you measure on the flower head, you could be up to 40% wrong in spread rate, right? Mm -hmm. So if your objective is to know whether this thing spreads fast or ultra fast, or kind of fast, then it doesn't matter which seed you use, right? Well, it sounds like you need many seeds, but that's well, another. It depends on how accurate you want to be, right? And then, <sighs> and then ultimately, if that level of variation is not of interest to you, then we can't. We can ignore. We cannot sweat the, st the small stuff. But if something like the, so, here's one interesting case: is in drought. We expected that drought would make the plants shorter and therefore make them very like poor spreaders. And it turns out that, and it's not actually even probably a, an adaptive response, it's probably just a stress response. The seeds also get smaller. And so they're lighter. And so they can disperse further. And so it's sort of an unanticipated response that I would say you probably want to sweat those details, right? Is because you'd think it, it's a counterintuitive case where, um, you know, the models might not be smart enough to account for it unless you put it in yourself. But, uh, so I guess it just depends on the objectives. If we're trying to catch cool biological things happening versus if we just want to know, have all, did all of these species migrate together over the same, you know, 5,000 year time frame, um, I think that the objectives need to be pretty clear in order to know what level of detail we want to go into. Well, I, I guess so maybe what I was getting at was more of the uncertainty type of thing mm -hmm. of where m parameterizing any such model based on one seed seems unwise. So, um, I'm sorry, that's basically all we do. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, but like, yeah, if, if, if that maybe what you need like ha is how much do some of these factors plausibly vary within the sort of population or time scale or whatever that you're interested in. Yeah, um, I think. I think in the ideal world, we would have lots, I mean, even if different individuals in different circumstances produce different variabilities, right? So if a plant that's super healthy produces very similar seeds versus a plant that's unhealthy that produces very distinct different seed types. Um, but on that, that fine scale resolution, like do we need to go there, I guess is my question. Uh, and it depends on the case. So, so for the competition and coexistence stuff, mm. so the theory on competition, so like the chess and stuff, yep. blithely assumes that the population you have is closed, and that's fine. So yep. you have a, you, you, the population occupies a large area. It's so big that you never get dispersal into your area, and you never get dispersal out of sure. your area. You just don't need to worry about it. Um, and that assumption works great in theory, and it always makes me g nervous in practice uh, be because of things that you can see there. So that is not a closed population. Things Certainly move in, not. things move out, things interact across it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm sure you've thought about that. And so I was just wondering about the, if, if the, is there a fix for that for a small empirical plot? Or is it just it, we're going to pretend Chesson didn't say that? We, we have to be very, so we have to be very careful in the modeling enterprise. So when we take parameters that we've measured in the field and then apply them, like our recruitment models in the specific case, where we're interested in, you know, we, we actually don't have the data for what individual reproduced and produced the recruits that we see. 
And so we have to be very um, clear about our assumptions in those cases. Um, and in the, in, this, in the models that I've been working with, there are lots of people working with these models, um, we assume that this plot is a closed system and then we try to model it in space, like as if like there's, and we have done some cross-checking with, um, to find out if surrounding individuals, there, there is a boundary where they actually do measure individuals. Um, and so they're trying to find out if surrounding parents could also contribute to recruits. Um, we do the best we can. in space, but could you use something like um, a tree that you could propagate vegetatively or a plant that you could vo propagate vegetatively and age and go into populations that exist across the landscape and say we're going to collect old plants and we're going to propagate those old plants and we're going to estimate growth at say a half a centimeter a year and so for every centimeter in DBA, so if it's got a meter DBH, you know, that it's a 100-year-old or a 200-year-old tree, and you propagate that at some point in time, and then you do a random collection of your population and uh, where you're collecting small trees as well and saying these are the young recruits, and so this is what the demography of the population looked like as recently as, say, 1980, which is the, where we're talking about climates really warming up, and then um, sort of rebuilding, you know, rebuilding a community back through time to look at demographic tra change, trait change, evolution, mm -hmm. geographic variation in demographic processes. So rather than focusing on scales like that, yeah, you could really think about time. Yeah, there is a group through Art Weiss's lab <coughs> who's doing, um, they are taking seeds from seed banks from like 20 years ago and comparing them to populations that exist now and trying to find out how phenology and sort of um, how the phenological responses of a plant that existed 20 years ago and still exists in a seed bank, uh, how those plants can compete with species that have been experiencing the environment all along. Um, so there are some kinds of experiments going on like that. Um, I think one of the major challenges is definitely that climate is heterogeneous. And so one of the problems that we deal it with, at least with this species, um, in Idaho we have 21 years, 21 climate years, and, or 22 climate years, and it, like many of those climate years end up being similar. So it's hard to actually uh, parameterize even a response curve because our sampling effort even in 20 years of data, it doesn't produce a, an entire, a nice phenotypic reaction or <laughs> Katie's not. And so I think the idea being that, um, you know, even if we were able to create a an experiment like that, it might take forever, more than a, a career probably, to quantify the outcome. Just because the year that you plant it in will be one type of year, and the next year you would have to do it again and <laughs> in order to understand all of the ways that the climate could affect the initiation of that community.